we had a very interesting time on my YouTube channel earlier this week. I uploaded a video that made a lot of people angry and resulted in many people saying unsubscribe and leaving huffy comments, uh, angry comments. Uh, in one case, somebody used my Jewish background against me. I had several people tell me I should go back to the to where I came from. <laughs> Congress, New York? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I do from time to time. So I thought it would, was important for me to reaffirm the core principles of this uh, harmonica channel and of my what I'll call my YouTube ministry of 12 years. And I realize there are some of you who don't don't know that I, I came on YouTube in 2007, early 2007, when there was literally nobody, with the exception of one or two videos from Jam Camp 06, nobody was giving blues harmonica lessons. So for so I began doing that and did 40 lessons in 40 days, and there's some of you who've been here the whole time. But that's... So from the beginning, it's been... From the beginning, I've had a reservation about what I've been doing. It's a reservation that took a while to really develop. Um, and I was aware that, you know, I created a, a bright, bouncy Adam Gusso persona. And that is mostly who I am. I'm a happy person, by and large. Although I've had unhappy periods in my life, and I really don't trust anybody who's playing this music who hasn't. But from the beginning of this call it a ministry, my desire has been <clears throat> to get as close as I can to my experience of the music, to whatever wisdom I've learned in the course of playing the music for more than 40 years, and really trying to be a conduit for something that would change your life, would transform your life, would put the joy that I've had inside you. And so the two words, blues harmonica, have been kind of at the core. And I, and, but my reservation has been, there's been several reservations. One is that I've made it seem too easy, too friendly, too easy to learn harmonica. As though there weren't a, 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 a personal journey involved, as though it were just a question of turning on the TV, playing along with Adam. Um, being kind of a consumer of videos. And I'm worried about that. that that's been a, a worry of mine. The second, the second worry was in that word blues, and that I, in that, which is to say, there's sort of a personal and um, a collective resonance to this music. Um, the personal resonance is whatever pain and challenges you bring to the practice of learning and, and playing blues harmonica. That's number one. And and so, of course, you know, I've been lucky enough to have a personal mentor, and I, I can't ultimately be that for you, I, but that's sort of what I've tried to do. And from time to time, realizing that there was something missing in what I was attempting co to communicate, um, realizing, for example, that I sometimes get emails from people who say, I want you to do this for me. Um, you know, please transcribe. People who, who actually don't seem to want to put any effort of the sort of sweat equity variety that those of us who've really learned to play the instrument had. So I'm worried that I was making it seem too easy. But I've also worried that I was um, in some weird way betraying a core value of the music. And the fact that it is a music that begins obviously deeply enmeshed within African American culture. Now obviously in the last 50 to 60 years we have an integrated blues scene, but I, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. Thinking about Sugar Blues Challenge to to people, uh, sort of the, the deep resonances of African American history that are in the music. Um, and so it's very important, I'm talking a lot, but I'm going to talk a lot, please allow me to, to do that. And so from time to time I've had videos like Respect the Blues, I ask you to go and Google, put Gusso Respect the Blues, you'll find that video, in which I've, I've sort of irritably tried to remind people that this music is, um, it's not a lightweight music, it's a deep music. Um, if you really pursue the journey, you're going to be taken places maybe you didn't expect to be taken, and not all of them are going to be fun. Um, there have been moments, periods of, of deep despair in my own life, and, and you know, that, that's all sort of there. It's in the background, and hopefully the music pulls you through. 
So th this is all a prelude to saying that I think some people who saw my video the other day, which struck them as sort of this wild explosion of political talk from a guy that they just wanted to be a nice, friendly, blues harmonica kind of teacher. Um, it didn't surprise me, but there was one person in particular, I don't know if, if you're still a if you're still a subscriber here who said, you know, I really don't think you should have gone in this direction because my kids watch your channel. My kid watches your channel and now I'm not sure I can let him. And I thought, well, that's actually good because I'm not sure that this is really kids music. I'm not sure this channel is for kids. Um, but here's one of the biggest misunderstandings. One of the, And so I don't mind anybody who responded to that All My People Are Immigrants video by saying, you know, I don't really like where you're going, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'll ignore this video and focus on the rest. The ones that I, that I thought were really problematic were the ones who say basically, just shut up and teach me how to play harmonica. As though, as though, blues harmonica were not the product of a people who had been told to shut up and just play music. Literally told, you don't have any space, I'm talking about black southerners, you don't have any space in the political arena. You're, you're not allowed to vote. In Mississippi in 1960, 6.7% of black Mississippians were registered. Is that because they didn't want to vote? No, they weren't allowed. In Alabama and Georgia, between 25 and 30% of African Americans could vote in 1960. In Mississippi, 6.5. Blues come from Mississippi partly because black people there are forced out of the political realm by Jim Crow, by the Mississippi Plan of 1890. I had somebody say, you're just one more entertainer who's decided to talk politics. Shut up. Well, I'm a professor at the University of Mississippi. I've been teaching blues lit for 20 years. So no, I'm not just an entertainer. If that's what you want, wrong channel. <laughs> wrong channel. And I thought, well, you know, what I need to do is I need to talk about politic politics and blues, just so that people who think that somehow the blues are never about politics, um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read you some stuff from a couple of books by a Dutch blues scholar named Guido, I think he's Dutch, Guido Van Rien. Guido Van Rien. There's one called The Truman and Eisenhower Blues and one called Kennedy's Blues. Um, and if they're perfect for you if you think, Gusso, you should just stick to blues harmonica. Teach me how to play the blues, but I don't talk about politics. As though those two things never go together as though those things never go together. Well, they do, actually. Um, and they do in the lives of black Southerners. And what's amazing, so there are signifying blues, um, like Big Boss Man, which is a song I love to play, Big Boss Man. Um, well, you ain't so big, you're just tall, that's all. You ain't so big, meaning you ain't so morally big, you're just tall. Now, I could point this directly towards our current president, Donald Trump, and say he's just, he ain't big, he ain't morally big, he's just tall, and you hate me, and I'll, you're going to hate on me. The point is, I could point that out, that there's a difference between sheer physical size and the intimidation factor that gives you, swinging the big one, right, and moral largeness. And that's the point of that song. You've just got the power, big boss man, but you ain't so big. You're just tall, that's, that's just about all. So I want to talk to you a little bit about blues and politics. Blues and politics. And I want to explain to you why from time to time, if you want to deal with me and my channel, well, you don't have to, but if you want to learn what I have to teach, because I just, you know, I don't, I, I realize that there are some people who love the sound of blues harmonica and love and want to learn blues harmonica and are also racist. It just astonishes me that that could be the case, but I'm sure that that is the case. And so if that's you, I'd really rather that you unsubscribe right now. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying. Because I want to teach the rest of you who aren't that kind of person. Um, I really do. But I can't do it with, a, with the heart that I need to have. So let me talk, let me talk uh, Truman and Eisenhower blues. Um, the, the, one of the first songs that came to my mind, let me, let me just... Uh, Take a look at this. So, Truman and Eisenhower Blues, page 44. Big Bill Brunzi, you probably heard of Black, Brown, and White. The song was written in, 18, in 1945. Um, none of the labels wanted to record it. Um, 
This little song I'm singing, brother, know that it's true. If you black and got to work for a living, here's what people will say. The chorus is, if you're white, you all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, oh, brother, get back, get back, get back. Now, there are people who will tell you, well, that was just, you know, Brunzi got picked up by, like Josh White, sort of, by the Cafe Society. He got picked up, he started hanging around leftists, basically, and they, well, now, Brunzi, Brunzi had a lot of experience, um, and that was not the only song he sang. Um, but it ends, I was in a place the other night, they were having fun, they were drinking beer and wine, and me, I couldn't buy none. That's Jim Crow. I was in an employment office, got my number, and I fell in line, they called everybody's number, but they never did call mine. And he does sort of a series of these choruses, and he ends, I helped to build this country, I fought for it too, now I guess you can see what a black man's got to do. Help to win this victory with my plow and hoe, this victory being World War II. So he's talking about citizenship. Now I just want to know what you're going to do about Jim Crow. That doesn't get much more political than that. That was Big Bill Brunsey in the aftermath of World War II when African American men were part of the victory effort. Um, and then they came home, and, uh, and then when they wore their uniforms, they got lynched. That happened after World War I, too. The song I thought about first, when I thought about those who would say, Gus, so just teach me how to play blues harmonica, but please don't talk about politics. Don't talk about our president. I thought about, there's a, I'm going to talk about some songs that are about presidents, but of course there's Dead Presidents by Little Walter. Make of that what you will. It's really just about money. And But here's what struck me was the song, and I'm going to read this. Um, on August 21st, 1947, this is on page 49, by the way, Senator and former Governor Theodore the Man Bilbo, so this is about Bilbo, the governor of Mississippi, died in New Orleans, died in 1947. Bilbo had been an outspoken supporter of white supremacy in the Ku Klux Klan. In a speech in Greenville, Mississippi, delivered during his 1946 campaign, Bilbo had said, and I'm going to quote his words, forgive me, I'm the best friend the niggers got in the state of Mississippi. I'm trying to do something for them. I want to send them back to Africa where they belong. I want to send them back. I think they ought to go back. So the other day I had a video in which I said I was kind of hurtful to me that our president was using words, the words go back, to talk about four American citizens that happen to be women of color. One of them is African American. Um, Go back. Go back. They should go back where they, kind of where they came from, but go back, go back to the asshole countries. He didn't use that term this time. That's odious, but it was used against black people, and I'm sorry. If, if you know that, then you know the resonance. Either you care or you don't. If you, if you love our president, I'm, I'm fine with that, but you want to just forget about the other stuff or don't care, but don't care, but at least acknowledge that you don't care. So that's what Bilbo said. I'm the best friend the niggers got in the state of Mississippi in the 1946 campaign. I'm trying to do something for them. I want to send them back to Africa where they belong. In this context, the irony of the first stanza of Andrew Tibbs's Bilbo is Dead from September 1947 is obvious. Tibbs waited until his final verse to indicate his true feelings, concluding that the death of the vile Bilbo might make Mississippi a fit place to live again for the thousands of African Americans who had migrated to the cities of the North make Mississippi great again. In this case, he was kind of right. The deeper meanings of Tibbs' song apparently did not escape the notice of Southern authorities, according to Muddy Waters. According to Muddy Waters. So he was listening to the song, too. You love Muddy? You love Muddy Waters? Gusso, I wish you would just give me blues harmonica lessons. Don't talk about politics. The record was widely banned in the region. Here's the song. And it was basically a man pretending it was a black blues singer pretending he was incredibly broken up that this governor of Mississippi had died. Well, I've been down to Dallas, Texas, and I'm going to give you a link. Even went to San Antonio, but when I got to Mississippi, my best friend was dead and gone. Chorus. Yes, Bilbo is gone. Well, he had to put it down. Well, I feel like a lonesome stranger. Yes, a stranger in my hometown. You know, the death of this racist white Mississippi governor who wanted to send them all back to Africa has made this black blues singer just cry. I was a playboy and a devil. I had times that was really wild. Since Mr. Bilbo is dead, it makes me feel like a fatherless child. Of course, this is all in total tongue-in-cheek. And the final chorus, well, you've been living in the big city, broke and had to get a loan, but you can hurry back to Mississippi because Bilbo is dead and gone. 
Yes, Bilbo is gone. Well, he had to put it down. Well, I feel like a lonesome stranger. Yes, a stranger in my own hometown. Yeah, you can hurry back to Mississippi now. It's okay, because the big boss man is dead. It was so political. Though a minor hit among blacks, Rick Van Reen says, Bilbo is Dead was too inflammatory to put in jukeboxes in the South and to get what little airplay was available for black music. Um, okay. Bilbo is dead. Bilbo is dead. In the 1954 recording, Democrat Blues by Detroit Blues uh, Detroit guitarist John Bobo Jenkins, we are reminded that it was the Democrats who had put the people on their feet after the Depression while the Republicans are characterized as the party of recession, unemployment, and hunger. You mean a blues guitarist sang about the political parties? I've... Gusso, stay out of politics. That's not blues. A high percentage of women had voted for Eisenhower, and Jenkins upbraids his girlfriend for joining them while remaining confident of a Democratic victory in 1956. This is his song. Well, do you remember, baby, 1931? That's when the Depression, baby, just begun. Yes, darling, if you know what I'm talking about, well, the Democrats put you on your feet, baby. You had the nerve to vote him out. So there's a blues between the man and his baby because she's a Republican and he's a Democrat. You didn't have to plant no more cotton, baby. You didn't have to plow no more corn. If a mule was running away with the world, baby, you'd tell him to go ahead on. Well, do you remember, baby, when the steel mill shut down? You had to go to the country because you couldn't live in town. Well, do you remember, baby, when your stomach was full of slack? Somebody help me get them Democrats back. Detroit guitarist John Bobo Jenkins. All right, let's take a look at a few more. How about some blues? <laughs> Kennedy's blues. Kennedy's blues. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting study. Um, everybody was upset when Kennedy died because he was no uh, big boss man who was just tall but not big. He was morally big. Down south, Memphis Slim. Memphis Slim. Memphis Slim's monologue with piano accompaniment, Down South, was recorded in a Chicago studio after Kennedy's election in November 1960. Really? This is what he said. I'll try to find this recording and link it. Down south, my native. Don't get me wrong, I'm not bragging, but I'm very glad, I'm very happy. Because being born in the South, you get so much experience. If you make it away from the South, you got it made. Mr. Bilbo, Mr. Crump, and all those guys, out to get you. Those are politicians, white politicians. But I had a brother, as you know, I'm six foot four. My brother called me Shorty. My brother was born above the Mason and Dixon line, Newark, New Jersey. My brother came down to visit me, you know. Being a good sport, I had to carry him around to the back door down south. This was where the Southern Cross, the dog, Moorhead. I know all you boys are familiar with this. So while in the pool room shooting a little pool, my brother, he always had a mind of his own. He gets hungry. You know, he steps next door to a bus station, not noticing the sign where it says, colored only. He goes in the wrong side, so they say, but my brother wasn't used to that kind of stuff, you know. So the guy says, what can I do for you, boy? Said, I'd like a hamburger. So the guy, he knew my brother didn't know what he was doing. He told him, he says, we don't serve Negroes. My brother says, wonderful, I don't eat them either. Give me a hamburger. So he got the hamburger. So I say that to get to say this, it takes nerve. Memphis Slim. That must have been a song now. He, he, so he brought politics full bore. He brought politics full bore. He brought Jim Crow. Dangerous stuff to talk about down south. Dangerous stuff. Mississippi in the early 1960s, there was a white newspaper editor who invited the freedom the uh, uh, freedom summer people into his house or freedom riders he invited to basically meet with them so he could understand what they were about and white people in his town drummed him out of town and he was just a centrist guy who just wanted to know that's Memphis Slim Memphis Slim BB King you like BB King should he just shut up and stop talking politics well you know how we talk politics 1962 he signed a new contract with ABC Paramount the BB King brand was going, was on the way up, right? It's a dangerous thing to do. Gusso, your brand is just sitting still, smiling, and talking about blues harmonica. You're gonna gonna downwardly inflect your brand. People are gonna go unsubscribe. I'm out of here. Do you think I care? I care much less about my brand than I do about educating you. BB <laughs> King, 
The A-side of his very first single for his new employer was titled, I'm going to sit in till you give in. It's 1962. They were sit-ins. This is Freedom Riders were happening. Sit-ins were happening uh, the year before in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. This is what he said. It's, he spoke it. Ever since the world began, men have received the right to live from God above. But there's only one right that you can give, and that is the right for me to have your love. That's why I'm going to sit in till you give in and give me all of your love. No use resisting. I'll keep insisting. Stop your conniving, girl. I ain't jiving. Oh, yes, I'm going to sit in till you give in and give me all your love. I'm going to sit in till you give in and give me all of your love. Nighttime, daytime, sunshine or rain, I'll be riding that old freedom train. Yeah, he's signifying a little bit. Signifying meaning hiding his meaning behind, you know, you know a male-female kind of thing. I'm going to sit in till you give in. He's talking about the sit-ins. It's pretty full frontal. You like B.B. King? You wish he would just sing the blues and the moment he goes to politics. No, because you, you didn't know about this song. You see? You didn't know about this song. Sun House. Well now there, if you want to talk about kind of an apolitical, like an old black blues singer who just thumped on his guitar and talked about religion. I wanted religion. He didn't talk politics, did he? Mississippi singer Sun House recorded a song called President Kennedy in 1965. Mm -mm. Mr. Kennedy was born, but now he is gone and never return anymore. Made me feel sad, and he's the best friend we had. He's for the rich and the poor. Now, I, I can't but shed tears. It'll last me for years. His memory still rings in my ears. Now, this I agree. He had a great family. They all seemed so happy and gay, from adults to a child. They all seemed to have a smile. They must have been born that way. Mm, now, God bless little John that little Caroline respond, and also their mother dear, his father, mother, sister, and brother, they must have been born that way. What you have to understand about Sun House and about that song is that to sing that song in Mississippi was to say that you loved a president, that you were feeling compassion for a president who most of the white people uh, in your state, the, the great majority of white people in the state, disliked intensely. He was associated with the civil rights movement. So it was taking a risk to do a song like that. Um, but Sun House did that. So the blues and blues harmonica. Accompanied by pianist Otis Spann and harmonica player Slim Willis, Mississippi-born mandolinist Johnny Young, who had been living in Chicago since 1940, described his reaction to the news of the president's death in I Tried Not to Cry. In his inaugural speech, Kennedy had said, if the free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. The black population considered that the president kept this promise. Young's statement, quote, he was for the rich, he was sure for the poor, would have pleased Kennedy. So here's the song. I tried and tried. So this is, this is Mississippi, this is Mississippi, uh, basically Chicago blues mandolinist Johnny Young. Political blues, talking about the president. I tried and I tried, but the tears kept on coming down. I tried not to cry, but the tears keep on flowing down. Our president is dead and gone, and the people can't be satisfied. He traveled around the world preaching things he wants you to hear. This is his life story, and I want everybody in Chicago to hear. We weeped, we cried, we said things all night long, although we know we was making a mistake because the president was dead and gone. He was for the rich, he was sure for the poor. Don't you know? You know he won't come back no more. And then he said, I want everybody to listen. Listen to what I will have to say. I want everybody to listen. Lord, it brought tears from my eyes when a young man dead and gone and the world can't be satisfied. Lord, have mercy, my song is not completed, but I just have to say goodbye. What's fascinating to me as a blues scholar about that is the way in which he uses phrases that show up in many blues, blues that are not political, like can't be satisfied, dead and gone, um, world can't be satisfied, all night long, we said things all night long, all that stuff, which usually gets uh, sort of depoliticized, there it is, and he's so he's trying to speak from the deepest wellsprings of the blues. That's all I have to say today. I'm not going to play any more harmonica today. I have other videos I'm going to do, including one that I was asked to do on stage fright. Um, I just had to get that off my chest, uh, and we'll title this one something about politics and blues, just so people understand that what I was doing the other day to speak from my heart in a rare direct political address on this channel um, was something that I have every right to do, and in fact, I would be betraying what I feel my obligation is to you in terms of trying to give you a, 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 a full and deep sense of what bl the blues and blues harmonica is about. I would be betraying my, my, uh, my mission if I didn't occasionally 
give you a video like that and a video like this. That's all I have to say for now. Hopefully you get where I'm coming from. See you later.